I have an absolutely great set of panelists for today, all of whom, by the way, are Stanford alumni. So happy to say that this is, this is uh, a good group. Sitting closest to me is Ms. Zhang Hee Jin, who uh, got her MBA at Stanford, and she also holds a master's degree in social psychology from Seoul National University. Uh, Zhang Hee grew up in South Korea, but she decided to embrace a new life in Silicon Valley when she got her MBA. She's worked for over 10 years in international business development in the video game industry. And in 2015, she joined a company named Vingle, which she will be talking to us about uh, more today. She is currently the general manager for the US for uh, Vingle. Sitting next to John He is Dr. David Bruner, and David is an entrepreneur on a mission to create intelligent software that makes uh, professional smarter. So sitting next to John He is Dr. David Bruner, who uh, is the founder and CEO of Module Q. And uh, he'll be talking to us more about Module Q. Before founding Module Q, David got his PhD from Harvard in Information Technology and Management a program that combines IT and also uh, business studies. And uh, he's also worked with the chief information <coughs> officer of Shinsei Bank to um, study their uh, IT systems. And he uh, was involved in the, in the design of the bank's next generation of workflow systems. Uh, he is fluent in Japanese. And as we'll find out in a little bit, um, some of the investors in Module Q are from Japan. Um, David is the person I've known the longest here. Because long back in the year 2000, David organized the very first Asia Pacific Student Entrepreneurship Summit at Stanford, which has been going on yearly ever since 2000, and uh, brings in about 40 to 45 students from top universities all over Asia for a week here in Silicon Valley. So you were a real pioneer at Stanford, too. And uh, sitting next to David is Buck G, and Buck is an executive advisor to Ascend, a nonprofit professional organization that is enabling its members, business partners, and the community to leverage the leadership and business potential of Pan Asians. Uh, he co founded the Advanced Leadership Program for Asian American Executives, which is an executive education program in the Stanford Graduate School of Business. He actually retired in 2008 from Cisco Systems, where he was vice president and general manager of the data center business unit. Um, he got into Cisco because his uh, startup company was acquired. And uh, he had uh, been the uh, president and CEO of Andiamo Systems, which was acquired by Cisco. Uh, he's also worked for these companies you might have heard of, like Hewlett Packard, National Semiconductor, 3Com. Uh, and he uh, has taught uh, computer and electrical engineering courses at Stanford and Harvard. And he got both Howard, his bachelor Howard. and master's <laughs> Howard, at not Harvard. Howard. Howard. I can't read. Uh, anyway, and he, he did get his bachelor and master's and double E from Stanford, and he got his MBA from Harvard. Okay, now we're set. So in one of the very first sessions when I talked about what's going on in Asia, I mentioned that in an innovation system, you have three main elements to look at. You have to look at people flow, capital flow, and idea flow. And as it turns out, I think our three panelists can address exactly those areas. So uh, first of all, I'm going to ask Zhang He to give a few prepared remarks on uh, what's going on with Vingal and how Vingal shows idea flow from Asia to the valley. Go ahead. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Chong Hee Jin, and as in slide, actually I go by JJ at work. Uh, so I just decided to. You can't hear me? Can't hear you. Cannot? Uh uh. No. Put it up a little closer to your throat. Is it better? No? Is it on? 
Is it better? It, it should be uh, on. They control okay. that back mm -hmm. there. All right, I'm going to try to speak up a little bit. Yeah. Better. <laughs> yeah, so I go by JJ after realizing actually my name, my name Chong Hee is not very easy to remember or hard to pronounce, or it's a little hard to pronounce for most of my American friends. So if you want to contact me after this class, just feel free to call me JJ or Chong Hee. I like both names. So uh, the professor introduced me briefly. I uh, came to the, the US in 2008 to do my MBA at Stanford. And actually before that, I've spent my entire life in Korea until 2008. And I worked in like a several different companies, mostly working in business development and business strategy for international expansion of those companies I worked for. And I think actually that's why I could be invited to this you know, great session to talk a little bit about my experience here. So today, actually, I want to share a little bit of my perspective on what Asia can mean for the next generation of Silicon Valley entrepreneurs. As a native Korean running an office in Silicon Valley for a Korean startup. So the first half of my slides are about Vingo's journey from Seoul to Silicon Valley. But the Vingo is the company I joined last year. It's a fast growing mobile app startup in Korea, but probably none of you guys like, have heard of it, I think. So I'm going to introduce a little bit about our business and how should we set up the US office. And the rest half of my slides will be about my thoughts. Uh, Probably just you know just briefly what I like to tell like a Silicon Valley people about Asian startups. I'm a little careful when I mention like Asia because Asia is a, such a big continent where actually, there are so many different countries are. So actually my experience, personal experience, is limited to Korea mostly. Though I've been working on like a lot of different like Asian markets and other like you know different countries. So when I say Asia, just you know, keep that in mind that actually most of my experience are actually just limited to Korea. So what is Vingal? Vingal is an interest-based community platform. And Vingal actually created an online service where users can connect, share, and interact with each other who share the same interest. It's offering over 3,000 interest communities from hobbies for professional topics to fandoms. So actually, this is the main uh, front page of our website before you sign up. And actually, you can get to actually choose what interest you have, actually what communities you're interested in joining. And then after you sign in, then actually, this is the first page actually you get to see. Because actually, I selected like a pet community and the funny stuff and food, those contents actually show up to me first. But if you just you know, select it like movie or soccer or any other like a hobby actually you're interested in, actually only those content will show up to you when you sign up and sign in. So I'm not going to go through too much about our product. I know actually there is a time limit for my presentation, so I'm going to just try to go fast. So Vingle was first launched in Korea five years ago, and it actually grew up very fast and became very successful in Korea, hitting 10 million uh, monthly users last year. And it's now a top-ranked interest-based social networking service and app, more popular than Twitter, Instagram, or Pinterest in Korea. And some of the largest communities on Bingo have over like millions of members each, only in Korea. So our business model is mainly advertisement. It's working pretty well so far because I think all the users already uh, said actually their interest, they are strongly interested in this, this, this topic. So there is, you know, actually on social media, there is a little resistance to, you know, advertisement. People just don't like just you know, viewing too many advertisements on social media. But I think there is less resistance in Vingle because they really don't mind like seeing a little more like advertisement content. So it's going really well. And we decided to set up the U.S. office in Palo Alto late last year. And actually we, uh, we are just doing like a marketing activities and community building activities for the U.S. market since then. Actually, Vingo actually set up a pretty uh, firm and clear global business strategies from the beginning. So, uh, one uh, really good pol uh, one good policy for us is like one product vision, where actually we want to build just one global product, just keeping the product same product features across the markets, 
providing the service in just many different languages. And to just make this possible, uh, the company just like built a very like a international team, like a multinational team, like a, from the beginning of product concept and development stage. And we hire like most of the employees, like a Korean English bilingual people. It might not sound very you know, great here, but it's very rare in Korea, and I believe it's probably rare in Asian companies. So the, the company really tried hard to make the team and the company and product very like a international or like a, a global, like a from the beginning of the, the, the business. Instead, actually, we tried hard to make marketing localized, which means actually we want to support users in different markets in the best way that suits that specific market. So actually, we have uh, regional offices in US, Japan, and also Southeast Asia, so that actually we can develop marketing strategies, PR strategies, and also do more like a content, uh, content strategy for those markets specifically by working with a product team in Korea together. Even though actually Bingo like started like a pretty like a, with a global vision for the product, not like other like a Korean companies who mostly just focus on domestic market first and then expand globally later. There are a lot of other a lot of challenges which we are facing here in the states. So I'm not going to go through like a, too much about everything. But one thing is like a user behavior is definitely different, which requires actually just different product features for us. So there are a lot of discussions about that internally. And this is a live service. So this is an online service. Actually, the product should be evolving. So there are a lot of things actually we have to do with our product team in Korea. But the live service, the product stage is different in different markets. For example, we're still like in a very early stage in this. In the, in the US market, but in Korea, we already grew a lot and there are a lot of users. We created like a, we started creating some revenue. So actually there are different issues on the product side, actually what we have to do to support those users and what we have to do to make more money in different markets. But unfortunately the priority is in the Korean market. So there are a lot of you know, challenges that are caused by that. So, of course, you know, there are a lot of co cooperations and communications going on between the product team in Korea and marketing teams in different regions, but it's not very easy to coordinate everything and make everything happen. And I think actually this is more problem for us, but there are different competitors in different markets, especially here, you know, we are competing with like a lot of bigger like a social media companies and even like, you know, like a Reddit, you know, they don't exist in Korea. People just don't know about like Reddit or BuzzFeed. But we realized that we have to come up with how we should you know the ideas, how we can differentiate from those competitors here. It's not just about different competitors too. Competitors are playing in a lot bigger scale. The funding size is different. Their marketing budget is different. The resource actually they can pull is totally different from us. So there are a lot of things that we have to figure out actually to, success, to be successful in the US market. There are cultural differences, but this is probably something all the companies are facing when they go you know, outside of their domestic market, so I'm not, I'm not going to talk about it here. So this is just you know, briefly about actually what Vingal is, actually what we are doing here in Silicon Valley, and why actually we just you know, came after actually we just you know, pretty like a successful in Korea. And from my experience, from Vingal and from like, other companies I worked for, here's a little bit about what I like to tell like Silicon Valley people about Asian startups. Again, actually there are so many different aspects I can talk about for Asia or Asian startups, but yeah, because of the time limit, I'm just gonna talk about one thing and go from there. And when I say Asia, it's mostly about Korea, but I think actually it can apply for other startups from many other Asian countries. So this is a very simple fact. Silicon Valley is not the only place where great ideas are born. It's very obvious, but here I think actually a lot of people just forget that often. So, uh, actually, just in, a, in the in the back in 1990s and early 2000s, even some of the Korean startups like I started with exactly the same business ideas as Facebook or YouTube and many other services that are popular here in Silicon Valley now. You might have heard of these companies like SciWorld. They had the very, very similar concept with Facebook, but now actually they are almost 
gone, even in Korea. They were very popular in like early 2000s. And Pandora TV is very similar to YouTube. They also started their business a lot earlier than uh, uh, YouTube became popular here. And Africa TV, they have very similar model with Twitch here. So all the services and many more actually you know, came first in Korea and other Asian markets. But they even like it got, they didn't you know, have a chance to be discovered here or used by the users outside of Korea, unfortunately. Even now, a lot of interesting ideas and services keep coming out and growing. But I think actually most of these like a Korean startups just like want to stay in the domestic markets only for many different reasons. But this is just, like a quick survey by uh, uh, done by like an IBM uh, research group, I think, at last year. And they asked like a startups whether they are expanding their business outside of Korea. And only 9% of them said, yes, we are. And majority of them were not. Even actually when they said, actually, yes, we are planning, it's just you know, in the planning stage. Most of them were not even thinking about it. There are many different reasons, but I think it's still like a language, still like it creates, like it puts some limits on actually what they can do, what they want to do. Because most of the products and services like coming out of Asia, <clears throat> they are developed by their local language first. Like a Korean company is like develop their service and products in Korean language first. So this is why actually Bingo wanted to go differently from even from the beginning. We actually developed all the services in English and Korean together and then just you know, translated to other languages all together even when there was zero user in that language. And also domestic market in Asia seems big enough to focus on when, especially when actually we consider like their, you know, internet penetration, like a mobile penetration, they really think actually, you know, it's kind of enough to focus on, which might be true, but, you know, they usually just don't want to see, you know, things like over that um, market. And there is still like a belief that they should work in the domestic market first to prove themselves before expanding to any other market. And there are also concerns that they will lose the competitive advantage <coughs> in other countries, which are all true, but even when there are good reasons to go overseas and even when they are very ready, it's really hard for Asian startups to you know, come to Silicon Valley or to do anything in the States because actually they are mostly lack of funds and resource to support that. Lack of funds and resources, you said? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is a chart I found uh, made by Mattermark uh, this year. This is an average funding size by country. So uh, actually, the, in the original chart, there was no Korea. So I just you know, used my own data and then just like put the Korea at, the, at, the, uh, at last. So compared to other countries, I think actually probably this is similar to other Asian countries. But actually, the funding size is still very, very small. So even when they are like ready to do more, it's really hard for them to do a lot of things at the same time with this like a little funding and actually when they are not really at a uh, revenue stage. So I think actually this is actually one of the biggest reasons actually why a lot of the startups in Asia just want to stay in there and not really just you know, do, trying to just go more bold, ambitious. So recently, actually, there is a trend. Actually, Korean startups actually get funded by big Silicon Valley VCs. Actually, this data is a little outdated, but the first one, Coupang, actually, they got a lot more funding uh, recently. They got one billion uh, by SoftBank Ventures, and also the the last one and the second round, like Uwa Brothers, they also got funded by Goldman Sachs last year. So these companies are growing very fast and very well, like doing really well in Korea. But still, I think actually there needs to be more uh, attention and for more investment uh, by Silicon Valley Ventures for Asian startups. So I just like to put some implications for Silicon Valley, just to you know, wrap up my short talk. I think actually Asia or Korea is not just a great market for Silicon Valley uh, companies. I think actually a lot of them just were looking at them just more for potential market where they can sell their products. But actually, like a, it's also a birthplace of great ideas and resource for creative minds, good, great engineers, and passionate business people. As I said, people just you know, forget that pretty often. So 
When you think about that, I believe there's a lot of room for cooperation and partnership opportunities between Silicon Valley companies and Asian or Korean companies, Korean startups. And because of this, I think actually both Asian and Silicon Valley startups can learn from each other by working together. And just to make this happen, of course, actually Asian startups need actually more or fair attention from Silicon Valley investors, companies, and entrepreneurs. They just you know, need more like media coverage, more investment, and more partnerships so that actually they can also just like spread their ideas and just grow their business in Silicon Valley. Thank okay, you. thank you very much, Chung Hee. While I'm setting up the next set of slides, I've got a follow-up question for you. The one thing you didn't say is, uh -huh. why did uh, Vingle decide to not only come to the U.S., but to set up shop in Silicon Valley? Actually, we were not really just thinking about Silicon Valley itself. We were just looking at different cities in the U.S. just to start with for the U.S. market. And then definitely, I think actually this is very just common conversation, just you know, going around like among the Korean startups. If they really want to do something in the States, they want to be in the best spot, best place just to do that. So when you think about, I think it's just Silicon Valley, of course it's a great you know, uh, place for great ideas, great startup ideas, but I think it's a really great place for the startup ecosystem. And there are just so many you know, great networks actually we can take uh, can take care of. So the company, even you know, despite of the the expense and all the you know costs actually we have to bear, just the company just wanted to just be in here just to just you know have more like a leverage. Did they look here. previously at all at the companies like SciWorld that sort of didn't get involved in the valley and so now they're not doing so well? Do you think that was part of it? Is that one reason they went bilingual, English, Korean from the very beginning? Yeah, I think actually all of that are probably relevant mm -hmm. because actually most of the Korean services, as I said, actually they're just developed in Korean language. And then actually all the like a cultural, you know, differences, they really like it can be mitigated when they just like just translate the service into another language. But when they just do this, like a kind of localization process, after actually they already got really famous or really big in one market, then I think it's, it gets pretty hard for them to make everything right for other markets. So definitely I think it's, that's one of the reasons. Yeah, okay. And one last question for you before we go on. This is not an, a, I would call this space kind of crowded, right? Yes. You mentioned the companies around here that are, <coughs> are doing similar things. Um, That's kind of, you know, it must have been hard to get people to take you seriously here. Mm -hmm. What was the best, what was the thing that most accounts for you being able to be taken seriously? No, usually it's just, you know, I just talk about how popular we are in Korea, how well actually we're doing in Korea. <clears throat> but even when I say that, I don't think actually I, my company should get kind of a fair attention from media or other companies that we'd love to you know, make a partnership with, probably because we don't have like a strong presence here. So this is actually one thing I'd like to ask you know those companies to like you know there are like so many great like startups outside of Silicon Valley, outside of the U.S. But they just think actually um they're not I've never heard of them. My friends never heard of them. So probably they're not really like a significant business, but they are and they have great potential. And one thing is really, you know, one thing I always just want to talk to, uh, talk about to like those like a potential partners to us is if you guys like grab us like at an early stage, you guys can get a really good deal like at a like a great price. I mean, <clears throat> you know, once actually these companies get really big, then you know it's it's gonna be hard for them to negotiate with you know companies like us, yeah. but. If you guys, I think it's kind of like a similar, you know, when actually when, you know, you move to a new neighborhood, you need a new friends. But those friends, like, don't know about you at all. And they're like, oh, actually, he's from, like, a countryside. He never, you know, gets, they, they never, you know, gets to see your real, you know, strengths. And then once, actually, they get to see those, he's already, you know, like, one of those most popular yeah. people in your class. So it's not going to be easy for you to make friends with him anymore. So 
when they're not really discovered by other people, you can take advantage of that opportunity just you know, by you know, approaching you know, first and then just you know, grabbing that. Thank you. Yeah. You have just said very eloquently one of the main points I wanted to get across today. <laughs> Great ideas coming across from Asia that we should not ignore. If you would pass the baton over Thank to David. You. David, would you tell us about yourself and about Module Q? Sure. Well, Richard, thank you for inviting me to join you today. Uh, good afternoon. Am I, is the audio okay? Thumbs up? Okay. Uh, so um, I'm an uh, academic turned entrepreneur uh, with a background in artificial intelligence. And my passion is trying to figure out, you know, AI has been in the news a lot recently, mostly in the context of, is AI going to take your job or take over the world? But is AI going to take your job? And I, my fascination has been with how do we get AI to actually enhance your job? And I think for, for some folks, unfortunately, truck drivers and taxi drivers being notably, notable examples, the, the handwriting's kind of on the wall. We're probably not going to enhance those jobs. Um, but for most of the jobs that we think about in the knowledge economy, and certainly if your job requires empathy uh, or if it requires creative problem solving, you have a really good chance that AI is going to make you more valuable rather than less valuable. And that's uh, something that I've always wanted to be a part of. So, I started out uh, doing my undergraduate work here in computer science. Uh, I worked with Edward Feigenbaum, who invented expert systems and did a lot of pioneering work in AI. I uh, did some work with him on uh, data fusion systems to detect uh, cyber warfare attacks. Um, and now I'm, I'm starting to take some of those ideas and apply them in my current company. So um, Richard already gave a far better introduction for me than I can. Um, but, but I did leave out one thing. You co-authored uh, a book with uh, Professor Feigenbaum is, about is, entrepreneurship in Japan. So I did write a book that is now unfortunately uh, severely out of date. It was published <laughs> back in 2002 about entrepreneurship in Japan. Uh, a lot has changed uh, with Japanese entrepreneurship since then. Uh, notably the M&A and IPO markets have, have developed a lot. Um, and, uh, and there seems to be a more vibrant, vibrant entrepreneurial scene there. Um, but the only thing I'd add to the introduction is that I've, I've done a lot of sort of going back and forth between the US and Japan. And so in the same way that JJ commented that her perspective is sort of uh, tilted toward Korea. My perspective is tilted toward Japan. Uh, to be quite honest, I really don't know much about the rest of Asia. Um, but I'm happy to talk about you know, Japan as a, as a pretty good sized constituent in Asia, and so I'm happy to talk about that. Uh, so my current company, Module Q, um, is building on ideas that I first encountered here at Stanford uh, in a book called In the Age of the Smart Machine. And this was written by an HBS professor, uh, Shoshana Zuboff, all the way back in the 80s. Um, and she made a point that I thought was really important. Uh, and the book actually reads pretty, it feels pretty current now, because she went into a lot of work settings. And she found that in many cases, unlike the examples of the taxi drivers or the truck drivers, managers actually have a choice about whether to use intelligent technology to replace workers and automate their jobs and de-skill them, or to use it to empower them and help them do their jobs better and make better judgments. And the, um, the distinction she characterized as automate versus informate. Uh, informate is kind of a mouthful. I prefer the, the term augment. Um, but when I read that, it seemed to me that uh, the world was going to need people who were committed <coughs> to building technology that would augment humans, uh, because that's the kind of world that I at least want to live in. So that's what I'm doing at Module Q. Uh, and we build technology that we call personal data fusion, uh, which is it's kind of taking the data fusion idea and turning it on, on its head. So Palantir is in the news a lot for data fusion. Uh, the NSA is in the news a lot for data fusion, taking data from lots of different sensors, putting it all together to figure out what's going on. I figure that if the NSA can use these systems to figure out what you're doing, why can't you use them to figure out what you're doing? Uh, so, so we turn the whole thing upside down and focus it on your work. Um, we tap into various data sources, email, calendar, contacts, and others, uh, workflow systems as well that you use in your work. Uh, we take mm. privacy really, really seriously. We believe that uh, total transparency <coughs> kills innovation, so you need personal space, you need privacy. That's something we're committed to. Uh, we have one of the leading uh, researchers on the uh, implications of excessive transparency in organizations on our board. Um, but our first product I'll, I'll just touch on very briefly. We call it Rev, uh, and it's designed to cut through information overload uh, for B2B sales professionals and help them be more responsive to their customers. Uh, so. 
Uh, we're, uh, we're currently pre-release. Um, for those of you who are already uh, looking for it on the App Store, the version that's there is an alpha, not supported. Please give us another uh, two weeks to get the, uh, the, the beta version out. Um, and this is something that you know, we're still in, in seed, uh, seed stage with this, um, but we're, we're pretty excited about it. So uh, with that, let me, oh, um, the importance of responsiveness um, for those of you who are into sales. I think this actually applies to all knowledge work and it's a way that, that AI can help us be more effective is being more responsive. And there's actually some great research that was done here at Stanford showing that in big complex projects, it's actually resolving the interactions between people that ends up slowing things down and stretching out timelines. And so if you can get everybody to be really rapid fire, being more responsive, you can shorten timelines, and in sales at least, you can increase win rates. And so if AI can help you focus on the most important thing uh, and help you prioritize, that's pretty powerful. So let me talk about what, what Asia, what Japan has meant to me um, in my entrepreneurial journey. Uh, and I've actually, Module Q has involved a, a lot of R&D, and so we're still seed stage, but I'm actually five years in. Uh, I've been full-time on it for five years. Um, over the course of that five years, we've raised um, several million dollars in seed funding, uh, but uh, more than one and a half million came from people that were connected to Japan. And I, I want to bring this up not because it's a lot of money. It's not. Um, you know, we saw the average Chinese Series A is like $100 million or something at this point. It's a small amount of money, but something that I think anyone who's been on entrepreneurial, and Silicon <coughs> Valley, entrepreneurial journey in Silicon Valley recently will probably be pretty familiar with is that for ideas that, that aren't quite in fashion or that are a little bit hard to grasp and they sort of require some exploration and some pure R&D, it's actually pretty hard to find the risk capital that will let you just go out there and experiment and explore. And so for me, part of that risk capital came from contacts in Japan uh, who, uh, for whatever reason, were not in the, the current uh, group think in Silicon Valley. And so I think with all of Asia, it can be really powerful to be able to reach out uh, for some of that early stage risk capital, for example. Some of it also came from Silicon Valley as sources as well, uh, but it was powerful to have the Japan angle. Uh, so, so flow of capital, um, I also want to talk about flow of ideas, uh, mm -hmm. although JJ already, already touched on that. But uh, a lot of the ideas, and when I talk about that, uh, the power of responsiveness, for example, the power of shortening the interaction cycles, uh, that's also known as just-in-time manufacturing. And there's a car company in Japan that did a pretty impressive job of, of sort of figuring that all out with the Toyota production system. And so um, the way that I came to those ideas and the idea of applying Toyota production system ideas to knowledge work uh, was actually through the research of a colleague of mine at Shinsei Bank in Japan, and it was my Japan network that led him to say, oh, gee, when you're over in Tokyo, you should meet these people. You should hear what they're working on. And I went there, and it turned out that what they were doing was exactly the kind of ideas that I wanted to begin to bring, use AI to bring to knowledge work. Um, and so those ideas um, ended up becoming a platform in many ways for my company. Um, and the, the third is sort of uh, leg of the pyramid is people, and there are lots of people for me in Japan that have influenced my business and my entrepreneurial uh, experience, but I want to, to highlight a couple of them and also to highlight that they're not all Japanese. They're all people that have a Japan nexus. Uh, one of them is a native Japanese who won the uh, U.S. Japan uh, Innovation Award a few years back, uh, Mitsuru, Mitsuru Izumo, the, uh, the CEO of Yuglena, which is, uh, I, I knew actually since he was a participant in the first uh, Asia Pacific Student Entrepreneurship Summit that I organized here at Stanford. That was how I got to know him. Uh, and his company is now um, uh, public and traded on the first section of the Tokyo Stock Exchange. And he's been an inspiration and actually someone I've looked to repeatedly because uh, one of the things that I really respect about Jap Japanese culture is that there's often a willingness to persevere, even when the odds seem impossible. Uh, and even when most people would have moved on to the next hot new thing, if you believe in it, to really just keep on tweaking it and tuning it. And I watched Izumo succeed in an impossible environment against all odds, bringing his uh, algae technology to market. Um, and it was, it was an inspiration to me that whenever I had a dark day, I would think of him and I'd know <laughs> that when he had a dark day like I was having, he never would have given up. Um, and, uh, the other two gentlemen here I'll mention just in passing, but Jay Gavetti <clears throat> is uh, the uh, Indian-born uh, former CIO of Shinsei Bank who developed some really radical ways 
to uh, engineer enterprise systems. And probably the only way that he was ever able to put them into practice and try them out and experiment and then pass on what he learned to me uh, was the fact that a Japanese bank, Shinsei Bank, ended up being bought by a consortium of investors including Ripplewood when bizarrely the Japanese government decided to send it, sell it off to foreigners. And so that created again a cross-pollinization cross and opportunity uh, for new ideas to emerge. And Alan Miner, as some of you here will know, is, uh, is our chairman and lead investor, uh, the founder of Oracle Japan, founder of Salesforce.com Japan. So it's sort of an interesting twist that he was bringing US technology to Japan. Now he brings Japan back to Silicon Valley. Um, I'll close just with, with a definition of entrepreneurship that I like because I think this is at some level about Asia and entrepreneurship. And I think it's, uh, it's one way to think about entrepreneurship is just sort of the building companies Silicon Valley style. But another is, is uh, Professor Stevenson's definition from HBS of entrepreneurship is the pursuit of opportunity beyond resources controlled. And those resources may be technology and ideas or capital or people. And my observation has been that the broader you cast the net, it's sort of the strength of weak ties in your network, the broader you cast the net, the more likely you are to find that resource that you need and to be able to access it when you need it uh, to realize your entrepreneurial vision. So I think on that level, connecting with Asia and connecting around the world is really powerful. Thank you, David. Okay. While I'm setting okay. up the next, next slides. Okay. So people have <coughs> even more time. Mm -hmm. And maybe even to a certain extent, Alan, they invested in your company here. And I'm kind of curious if they took heat from people in Japan saying that we don't have enough you know, venture capital money, we don't have enough investment money in Japan, and so you should keep your money at home. If they did, they didn't tell me about it. Uh -huh. uh, Izumo is, uh, has set up his own uh, venture capital fund as a branch of the brand, <coughs> although they're focused. It's kind of a, a unique Japanese angle on things because they say, we only do stuff that's not pure software. It's got to have a, a physical monozukuri component to it. Um, but my perception is actually that early stage venture capital or early stage capital in Japan, uh, as far as I can tell, and there'll probably be experts even in the room who may know better than I do, uh, but is not now that hard to come by. Uh, expansion stage capital, I think a little bit more challenging, but at this stage I'm not competing for that. Yeah, okay. No, and I think that it's just fine. Feel free to talk <laughs> about ideas and people as well as to talk about money, right? So, but if I could ask you to give your comments. Sure. Um, uh, <clears throat> so, by the way, I'm just recovering over a sore throat, so just forgive me for this. Um, but I'm going to do something a little bit different. Uh, my question, or my topic, is really the question of Asian leadership in Silicon Valley. And let me start the discussion or, with this story. So I was acquired by Cisco in 2004. I think uh, Richard said that. In 2006, I was sitting at my desk reading my email uh, one Sunday morning when I realized I'm the only Chinese vice president engineering here. And and I said, I wonder if that's true. So I sent an email to Charlie Jean Carlo, at the time was head of development at Cisco. And I said, Charlie, I, I, I've just been here for a couple of years. Maybe there's some people I don't know, right? Um, there are you know, 20,000 engineers in the US. Am I the only one? And Charlie wrote back and said, you know, Buck, you are the only one. Uh, I've often, often noticed that myself and, and wondered why. You know, can you find out what's going on? What can be done about it? So those questions from Charlie led me to the things I'm going to talk about today. Okay. Uh, as some background, uh, I think you heard some of this. I started out as a computer designer uh, at HP. Actually, my fellow computer designer back from 1972 is sitting over there in the corner, Kenyon. Uh, he's smarter than me. He got a PhD, so obviously he was better. Uh, uh, I, I, I got tired of that, so I went to back to business school. Okay. Uh, I worked at big companies and small. I started with HP. I ended up with Cisco. In between, I started or was part of six startup teams, uh, three good ones, three not so good ones. You know, so I, I made some VCs money and lost a lot of money for other VCs. Okay, that happens. Um, uh, uh, so I was acquired by Cisco in 1993. I was like Cisco's first acquisition crescendo. Uh, Com21 was a McCabe Modem company, went public, and then my last company was acquired by Cisco in 2004, where I became general manager and vice president. Uh, a lot has changed since uh, 
since uh, I, I graduated from Stanford. Actually, I, I used to have my um, undergraduate circuit design class in this room. And there were about 30 people. Okay, there was, there was one woman and three Chinese guys. Okay, that's it. You know, in, in 1970, there are 1.5 million Asians in the U.S. Now, there's 1.5 million in the Bay Area. So a lot has changed, okay? Um, and the narrative of Silicon Valley is that we're doing great. If you look at, uh, oh, the picture didn't jump. Uh, you look at Asian Americans, 6% of the population, but actually in the Valley, we're actually over half of the high-tech workforce. Half of the professionals. Are um, we missing a graph? No, 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 not yet, not yet. Okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> it will be there in a second. Okay. Uh, and and actually, the 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 a study came out a couple years ago that either seventy somewhere between seventy and eighty percent of the Asians in in the Bay Area are either first or second generation. That is either immigrant or children of immigrants. Okay. Like she's first. She came here, right? You, yeah. Born in Korea. My father came here, so I'm second. Um, so that is the general narrative. And the question that's generally asked about Asian Americans is this question. This was an a, uh, op-ed by Nicholas Kristof about six months ago, I think six months ago, in the, in the New York Times. And his question is, why are Asian Americans so successful? You know, because we're too successful is the implication. All right? Well, that's not my view when I'm the only one. So let's look at the data about us or Asian American Silicon Valley. And this is a, a, a very complicated chart, but I'll work you through it. This is EEOC data. And there are every company greater than 100 people must file an EEO1 report. An EEO1 report is an interesting report. It has uh, each race and gender by job category. So you can look at each race and gender as professionals, individual contributors, managers, and executives. And so if you look at the chart on the left, it looks at the men. And you look at the chart on the right, it's women. Okay? And within each chart is by race. So the general narrative of men is they're doing great. And if you look at the top line, it's that red line, they're doing great. There's 71% of Professionals and what? 81% of executives. But then when you break it down by race, you get a different story by race. If you look at the white men, they're doing great. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a linear, all right? it's a line between 31% to 50%. Look at Asian men, they start at 36%, so there are actually more Asian men in the workplace than white men. But, but it doesn't go up, it goes down. 36% to 27%. The other curves are, are in, in the 2% range. Those are blacks and Hispanics. So it's clear what the, their problem is. Their problem is there, there are not enough of them in Silicon Valley. The Asian problem is there are lots of us, okay? but we're not doing well through the pipeline. Okay? On the right is the curve for women. If you look at the blue curve on the top, it, it, it tells a general narrative of, of women. That is to say, it's 26% of professionals, and then it drops down to 12%? 17? 17%. 17% of executives. goes down. But another interesting thing happens when you break it down by race. If you look at white women, they're 9% of professionals and almost 11% of executives. It went up. But the reason, and the reason that the overall number went down is because if you look at Asian women, there are more Asian women than white women in the workforce. And they're, they're, if you look at that curve, it's a straight line down. The other numbers are blacks, Hispanics. Again, their issue is, their issue is um, uh, they're just not enough. That's clear. It's hard to compare, though, if you just look at these numbers. An easier way to compare it is, is that you take a normalized index. You look at what the pipeline looks like, okay, independent of the numbers. Right? And this is what the pipeline looks like. 
for, for white and Asian men and women. Um, <clears throat> so it's, it's just a one. White men basically go from one to 1.6. White women go from one to 1.19, and the Asian men and Asian women. Okay. Is that clear what this chart shows? So, so once you look at the normalized index, then you can compare, you compare each cohort. What this says is that, that white, the gap between in terms of relative performance through the pipeline white men are doing 39% better than white women. That's what it says. Whoops. Hello. Oops. That's not good. Down. There we go. Got it. But before, while I've yeah. got to stop, sure. about what year is this oh, survey? Sorry, I should tell you, this is EOC da 2000, 2014 data. Actually, I have the data from 2008 to 2014. Um, but I decided not to show it. It's, 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 you look it's at the trend, actually, yeah, you can see trend. So the 2014 data, so the latest one they have. This is on the EEOC website. They actually want to look at the data. They actually have the data. They actually have the data sets if you want to put in a spreadsheet like I didn't do the same thing. Okay. Anyway, this says white, women, uh, white men are doing 39% better than white women. Okay. So it's clear there's a, there's a gender problem. Okay. Um, Asian men... White men are doing 123% better than Asian men. And drug comparison, so, and, and white men are doing 340% better than Asian women. There's another there's analysis you can go through in looking at the gender versus racial gap. And what you do is you look at the, you look at the gender gap, the difference between white men and women, Asian men and women, and then you look at the difference between white women and Asian women, white men and Asian men. So you can look at the gender gap versus the racial gap. And, and you can see that the, the racial gap, the Asian factor, is much, much greater than the gender factor. The gender factor is actually very similar okay, for, for Asian and white, very similar. But the racial gap for both men, men and women are much greater than the gender gap. Okay, that's not uh, interesting, and this is interesting data. Not, this was not intended. This is not what I was looking for, but it's what I found. Um, and and surprisingly, the actually, I've actually spent some time with EEOC, and there's no one else looking at this data. No one else has broken out this data by, by by race and gender. So no one's pointed out this issue. Until until we started raising the question. Okay, it's a question. Why? Right. So, um, so my argument is, so that if you look at the data, uh, I want to tell a different story about the Asians in Silicon Valley. Okay, we're not the success story that, that uh, Nicholas Kristof says we are. Okay. We're okay, okay, but in terms of influence and power, um, yeah, we're, we're most of the workforce. When people talk about Silicon Valley innovation, when people talk about Silicon Valley technology, they're talking more or, more or less about Asian technology, Asian innovation, because that's us. But when they talk about leadership, that's not us. So that's a question. Why? Um, as I said, if you look at, you can crunch the numbers or anything you want. You, you, this, if the Asian factor, the Asian glass ceiling factor is much, much greater than the gender factor. Okay. Um, a lot of question about this. And, 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 and for in the C-suite, it's even worse. There's 33%, right? But I'll, I'll, I'll just anecdotally, um, you, you want to know how many Asians are in the C-suite at Apple? None. Or HPE, the, the split off HP Enterprise, you want to guess? None. Or HP? None. Facebook? None. Yahoo, there's one, was one Asian executive in Asia. So, 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 so it's even worse at that level. Okay, this, when I say executives, this, this is actually all Asians, three levels from the top and three levels. So it's executive team, and then it's like basically um, senior, senior VPs, VPs, and directors. 
okay, for de as definition. All right. Um, so what's the problem? I, I, in, my answer, that, as I said, I, uh, Charlie said, can you find out what's going on? And this is what's going on. What can be done about it? My conclusion from a lot of work is it's cultural um, and that by and large, Asians need to understand the, the dominant la management leadership culture in Silicon Valley. Um, and I'll talk about this in a minute in terms of, of his story. Um, this is a, a graph, and it was actually very funny. This is, I was sitting in a friend's office at AIG. She just started AIG, and I said, so how is AIG? She says, well, I, you know, I just took a long questionnaire that looked at my management traits, the way I manage people, and, and they had me, and the questionnaire was by Appearian Global. Appearian Global teaches cultural sensitivity, so for global companies, there can be way the people behave differently in different countries. So you as a manager need to understand the people you need, your, your team in France is different than the people in, in Germany or, or Japan or China, and you need to adapt to that style to be sure you, there's no miscommunications on what you expect and what they're doing. So really it's cultural sensitivity, it's not diversity thing, it's really cultural sensitivity, how to adapt your behavior. So I said, that's an interesting question. I, I, I wonder, in that case, I wonder what the cultures look like in three Western countries and three Eastern countries. And I had hoped for something like this, but this was the data that popped out. And it was five different dimensions of management or leadership. And, and, and what, you, what they would, you do is you say, where do I fit? And then how do I adapt to that? So what kind of a survey was this? So, so, this is, so what it is is they, you, they, ha they have a lot of clients and they have um, people take these questionnaires and they crunch the numbers and they create what your curve looks like. So this is the median points for 700,000 people taking questionnaires. So it wasn't a survey, it was a questionnaire. So this is, self, this is your own data, this is what you said you are. So you can see in, U in US, Canada, and UK, they're all on one side of the cultural curve, manager curve. And India, Japan, and China, they all put themselves on the other side. Okay. Um, egalitarian versus status, for example, is, you know, is basically, you know, do you think about collective or do you think individualism is a simple thing. Uh, uh, direct versus indirect is, you know, are you, are you willing to, to, to deal with conflict or do you just, are you passive aggressive, for example. And I was surprised to see that, yeah, I mean, this suggests that there are cultural differences in the way that people are. And for most Asian Silicon Valley, first and, first and second generation, brought up by parents or grown up in China or Japan, you know, you're on that side. You have to understand that most of the valley is on the other side. And you have to understand what that gap is and what you need to adapt to it. Okay? That fundamentally suggests what the problems are and why there are not as many Asian Americans reaching executive suites because it is dominantly Western manager culture. And if you don't adapt to that, then you are not identified as high potential and not developed. Um, actually, I want to go, I want to go uh, one slide and then go back to this one. Uh, so as Richard said, one of the things I decided was, OK, then let's, in that case, let's, let's teach the you know, the high potential Asian Americans, um, what leadership is in the Valley. I went out looking for a class to do that. I couldn't find anything at that level. Everything, all the leadership classes you could find are also mid, essentially middle management leadership. Okay, middle management management. So I talked to Huggy Rao, who's actually sitting in the front right beside me there, who's a professor at the GSB. I said, here's the problem, da, da, da. I think we need to teach them these issues, There's some thick issues I want to address. And, and I was able to talk him into doing this um, because he was actually thinking about doing a CEO boot camp for Asians. And because, because he had gotten word from his venture capital friends that yes, a lot of Asian Americans are entrepreneurs and start companies, but when they get big and become real, most of them get replaced because they don't know how to be a CEO. And those same factors that, that, the same factors that I would find in corporate, the same issues. 
So he said, oh, it's great. You know, it's a bigger market. There are more executives and more companies than, not as, more than, than VCs in the Valley. So we've been running this program since 2010. We get about 40, 50 people a year, all funded by their companies. OK. But the point is that, that Huggy made, yeah, you can start a company, but when it becomes real, you get replaced unless you understand there's a difference between technical management and organizational leadership, in summary. Uh, if you want to understand um, kind of what it's like, these are great books. Uh, Sheryl Sandberg's book, her, her lesson for women are, are, are almost all the, all, all the same things I would say Asians have problems with, you know, leading and stepping up, arguing. Uh, Power is a, is a book by Jeff Pfeffer. Jeff is a professor at the Stanford Business School. And, and he, he is a very controversial um, approach uh, about building influence, doing things to build influence in organizations. And you, are, and you get things done through, through relationships and through personal influence, right? Not through technical knowledge. Not for, not for not, 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 you know, it doesn't matter how, it doesn't matter if you work hard or you're smart, that, that's irrelevant because everybody's good enough. It's all through personal influence. And I read his book, and I, I, I may disagree with his premise, that's the way you do it. But I looked at all the things that you do to do those things, and I realized I was doing all those things, not, not because I was trying to build influence, just because it was the right thing to do for the company. And that's just what I, the way I was. So the argument is, if you read the book and you're not doing some of those things, then, then the likelihood that you'll be executive, perceived as an executive leader is not as high as it would be. Okay? I, I was fortunate, I was lucky enough to, to kind of fall into that kind of personality to do those things. Most Asians do not, that I've seen in, 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 certainly in my organizations in Silicon Valley. Okay. So actually, I think that's an incredibly important point, and I think that this sort of perception of culture is one of the biggest issues. What you were talking about, JJ, uh, about you know people don't take your startup seriously. Okay. There's a great deal about how you present your startup here that kind of goes against the way you present things in Asia. Yeah. I mean, that's a really powerful, you know, cultural median about whether you're independent and whether you're status conscious or egalitarian <laughs> conscious. Uh, one question for you, and then I'll turn this to the floor. Do you see change? How much have you seen change, say, when, when you started this program right. before the GSB was like, what, five or six years ago, seven or eight years ago? The, the program on Asian yeah, American Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, has the valley changed? Um, well, not so much has the valley changed, but are we seeing a change early in progress, or do you see any indications of that? I, I, I think it's, I think it's too early. I, and I'll, I'll make this other, make one comment. The um, one one question I always get asked is, uh, is uh, the millennials are different. You're different, <laughs> right? You know, millennials are different. And so we should expect when the millennials become uh, get into the pipeline, uh, it should this should be radically changed, right? Uh, and I haven't I haven't seen the data for that. And the reason and the reason is this: a couple years ago, is again anecdotal. This is an, totally anecdotal. So there was an article that I forget what magazine it was, in, but the top 150 most influential entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley, right? People like Zuckerberg, you know. So these are almost all millennials. A few few older VCs who wouldn't throw into this, but almost all millennials, and and about again about 135 of them. And I I always when I see lists like that I always do counts, and I counted uh, 12 percent 12 percent Asian, pretty much the same percentage that when you look at the top 25 companies in the Bay Area, you look at Asians on the executive staff, it's about 12 percent. So there, there was no difference between established companies and this list of most influential in millennials. So uh, you know, there's no data that, again, I, I have no data, but at least, at least in terms of perceived leadership in the Valley, there's no change. There's some, but not many. Yeah, and I do think that the people are the key, right? I mean, if people cannot become leaders here, if they can't stay with the company until the company is the you know ten billion dollar a year company, then uh, really will we be able to successfully import the ideas? Will we be able to have the kind of flow that really is essential to the valley continuing to evolve? 
I think that's I, a, I, a very good I, question. I agree. Um, we have a lot on the table, not just the points that Buck made, but about the future of Silicon Valley. I'd like to open the floor to questions. Ed. Um, Buck, I'm curious about something. Does the reverse brain drain play a role in this at all? Um, whenever a, a country um, is really successful at sending students here to grad school, for instance, Korea, Japan, now China, we hear how the local companies there uh, do heavy recruiting here to get those kids to come back. So the sea turtle effect. Do you see that playing a role? Um, so uh, the question, the question is, is reverse brain drain a, a part, of, part of what I see? And the answer is no, uh, it's for two reasons. One, if you actually look at the number of Asians in Silicon Valley, it's increasing, okay? So, so, it's, 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 so there may be some people going back, right? But certainly if you, if you look at the numbers in the valley, they're continuing to increase, okay? I mean, so I don't, you know, it, and yeah, I don't see it. Yeah, go ahead. So, yeah, the question is uh, that data, uh, incidentally, it's, it sort of fits in with a lot of recent economic research also, which is showing our and difference between first and second generation. I think that will show some trends. But have you corrected it for education and uh, line of uh, discipline? Because what may be happening is, quote unquote, most of the Asians, and I know that for the Indians there have been some study, tend to be quote unquote techies, which while a lot more, for it, let's say more MBAs might be going in, you know, the, the proportions may be different. And people who are going to management and C-suite might be people who are finance or business. If you make that correction, is that different? Secondly, uh, my wife 30 years ago did a difference in implicit theories of leadership in US and in China. Yes. And it was dramatically different for some of the norms, yes. all the sorts of it things is. which are masculinity, yep. decisiveness, etc., which were here in China, at least right. at that time, were, exactly. very, were not at all present. So the question I have is, uh, have you actually tried to dig a little deeper into those five risk, five attributes? So, um, so the two, two, two questions. The first, the first question was, so last, last question, do I have, it, have I dug into deeper in the five attributes? Do I know a little bit more than that? Second question, the first question was. Correction for. Correct, correction, correction for. for you know, when you do the statistical analysis, you have um, to correct for education levels and. So the, so the, so the uh, so the data I have from the EOC does not have that information. Okay, so I can't use that. And and there's some other I, there's some other studies, but I'm not going to comment on those. Okay, um, I, I will say this: your qu question, do people through finance and marketing? Do, if I just look at the data I know for engineering, so we are all engineering, uh -huh. right? Is this pattern still holds? I will. Uh, I will tell you this. So in Cisco, where 60 per, six zero percent, almost sixty percent of engineering is Asian, Indian, mostly Indian Chinese. Yep. Sixty percent. Okay. When we looked at the high potential pipeline, every year we go through and it's do an assessment of high potential. This is just engineers. Okay. It was fifteen percent. One quarter of the total population of, of what it ought to be. Okay, so to answer your question, it has nothing to do with finance, it has nothing to do, it has to do with behaviors and expectations and some, some question about implicit bias. But I do think that um, it's important that your conclusion out of this is not so much that there's prejudice against Asians. I mean, that's part of the picture, but the, the point is that Asians have to do something. Right. Yeah. You have to develop the leadership right. norms. You, that you, need, to under you need to understand, you need to understand leadership norms, and the reason I say you need to understand that is because certainly large corporations, if you're running your own company, that's fine, then you can do whatever you want. But if you're doing it in a large organization like Cisco or HP or Intel, you're dealing with norm that has certain behaviors and expectations of what leaders do. You know, uh, it has to do with being able to make decisions, it has to do with you know, influence in the organization, indirect influence in the organization, it, it, has to, it has to do with, uh, I mean, willingness to pull the trigger and willingness to lead when you don't know exactly where you're going. 
So one of the things that I'm curious about that's a very deep question is, will the leadership style of the Valley change as we have more Asians here, as more people take part in the workforce? Um, there are people like David who have worked closely with people like Ismail San, and I think a lot of what you value about him are some of these traits that you know may not do so well here in the Valley. Uh, but I'm, I'm kind of curious if the Valley will change its culture over time. Ask that, I say, I've been, yeah, I'll ask, ask that to, to everybody on the panel. Yeah. And I guess the, we were sort of having some conversations about what other variables play in here, and I think you've already mentioned that the, the big companies and the entrepreneurial ventures are very different. And I, I it think is, it is. even within Silicon Valley, you know, Cisco or Oracle are very different beasts from the companies that are entrepreneurial now. And so the only observation I have is that I have seen, you know, as I'm out looking at other startups and at VCs, um, you know, lots of different management styles, and some of them kind of bizarre. Uh, and so I think it's there's a long way from the little company to Cisco or Accenture with 375,000 people. And so my, my impression is that the culture is changing, management culture in the startup space is changing pretty rapidly. And you know how big the disconnect is because as soon as they get acquired by Cisco, everybody leaves, right? So not, I guess, Buck, you stuck around and made the, made the transition. There are a lot, lot, there of, are people, a lot of people who leave. There are a lot of people leave, right? yeah. Um, and, and it does seem like at the very least, having the influx of people from different backgrounds is opening up the awareness of the different kinds of communities you can have in an early stage venture. Uh, what, what, JJ, what, I'd what, really like to hear your comments yeah. on yeah. this. Yeah, <laughs> I wanted to add a little bit, actually, when actually the first question came out, because actually, uh, I actually came to the States when I was already 30, so I, I would say I struggled a lot, especially when I first like started school and also first started uh, working after school. Because actually, I think actually I really like I didn't understand what works well like in the um, in terms of culture, and also I think actually when actually we talk about leadership, I definitely think actually Asian people actually whether should they grew up in the states or whether they are just originally from Asia, I think they really need to learn actually you know what actually works well actually for you know like a leadership or management, because this is like being humble. Is the best thing actually you have to have like as like the right manner actually when you deal with other people like in Asia. So even actually when I was school, I always said actually, oh, I'm not doing, I'm I'm not good at this, I'm not good at this. I always thought that. So actually, in my leadership class, I was pointed out by my instructor all the times. She told me like, you say that too much. Don't say sorry too much. Don't say she you are not good at this. You know you don't you don't even need to talk about it. So even when I work. I always think actually, you know, what I'm missing because actually, I'm. I don't think actually, I'm really like in the mainstream. I think actually, a lot of Asian people, even when they just like they were born and raised in the U.S., I think that they sort of have this a little bit. Even actually, when they're a little different from me, I actually feel this a lot. And they, because of this, don't get that ambitious. Just you know, just like a, you know, doing better at work. I think actually, they're more content about their current status. Like. Oh, just you know, getting a, like a, having a job, you know, is fine with me. I really don't want to want to don't want to get to to the CEO level. That's not my dream. Even I sometimes say that. So I think actually it's very different when they are back in Asia. Probably they can be a little more ambitious because of all the context and environment that is totally different for them. But when they are here, I think actually a lot of Asian people think actually they. Really, just you know, don't want to get to the top level, or when they don't need to be that ambitious. I think that kind of mindset is is here a little bit. So, in terms of that, I think I should probably like a, something like a leadership program can help a little bit. But also because I think Silicon Valley is constantly like emphasizing like diversity and actually how it should beneficial those like a diversity can be for like organization and companies. I think culture can change, definitely change. But for me, it's gonna take a lot of time. <laughs> I think the corporate culture or any type of culture has a long history. So I don't think it can really like change over like you know 10 years, like 20 years. But I think and hope actually it's gonna change. Yeah, okay, that's a really, really good comment. I saw a question back here, go ahead. Uh, yeah. In the context of what Buck said in terms of 
uh, large corporations overseas, uh, in particular in Asia, being predominantly filled by you know, ca ca Caucasians. I was just wondering, in the Emperor's case, in this, in this conversation, what is it like for a native Asian you know, of that Asian country who learns leadership styles here in Silicon Valley, who goes back to, say, hypothetically, like, you know, Japan or for Korea, fills an executive position there and exudes, you know, those type of more, you know, Silicon Valley or Western, you know, behaviors in that situation. How is that perceived, you know, by locals? And to what degree is that, can that be, is it, would that be permissible? So this is the kind of sea turtle phenomenon. Somebody does pretty well over here and then goes back to Asia and becomes the CEO of a major group back there. How is that perceived? Well, is, that, yeah. is that your question? Well, like even like for like each like working at an HP branch, like yeah. you know, in, 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 in Korea. So, like say you know, just hypothetically, JJ you know climbed ranks at HP and she went back. She went back to you know Korea, but within within the cultural organization, you're saying like you know HP runs more on the Shell Sandberg and this Pfeffer power type type of mentality. To what yeah, extent? Yeah, I think. Uh, uh, let me comment on this real briefly. And then oh, I, then this I'm is kind of a little bit. Okay, but it's a little bit away from what we're getting at, the future of Silicon Valley, right? But I think that there is a real difficulty anytime you gain international experience. How do you sell that international experience back at home? No matter whether you're coming from here to Asia or whether you're coming from Asia to the U.S. And I was in a, a program sponsored by the National Science Foundation about returnees to China and what was happening in the labor market in China with people who were returnees. Some of them are regarded as, of the returnees were regarded as very arrogant, requiring much too good conditions, sort of like you would get here in the States, and so they did not do well, right? Other people were showing, you know, the kind of leadership that people have here, and, and their organizations were able to accept them better. So I think that the real danger is for an individual is how do you market yourself and what you have? But you had a comment on that real quick. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> my, my, my comment actually goes back to the slide on cultural sensitivity that Appearing Global had. You know, again, w what it shows is that the people, you know, filling out the questionnaires are self-identified as having cultural traits. So if, if, you, if you're on one side, if you're in a, just like as I said, if you're an Asian, if you grew up in Asia, you come over here, you have to understand what the Western culture is, otherwise you don't fit. Same thing if you're if you're on the on the right side and you and, and you take your U.S. style to Asia, you're not going to fit. Okay, so so you have to be culturally aware of the dominant culture around you. At Cisco, we had a, we had at Cisco in Japan and a Cisco, we had a Cisco office in China. Uh, the culture was mostly local. There was Cisco elements to it, but it was still mostly local. Unless you understood that, yeah. then you would you were not going to do a good job. Sometimes the most domestic corporations are the overseas branches of American ones. Uh, I have to uh, pretty much call an end to things. I'd like to make a comment. As we have this cultural change in the very, very early stages, kind of going back to what you said, JJ, you should always be looking for competitive advantage. And if you find good ideas from somewhere that don't fit into sort of the Silicon Valley soup du jour, or whatever, everything seems to be really popular in one particular business line now, you may be able to uh, achieve some things that uh, would be exceptional successes. The same thing about looking for people who can support your company with the funds, right, the investors, to look for the people that you really need on your team because of what they know and what they bring, no matter where they're from. We have been doing this series on Asian entrepreneurship for more than 15 years, and one of the reasons is because the Valley needs to watch Asia. We need to see what this means to all of us and how we are going to need to change things to move things further along in the future. Uh, I want to thank everybody who has been participating in our seminars. Really appreciate you coming out and supporting what we're doing. If you would, please join me in thanking our uh, panel for a great discussion.